In 2006, National Geographic published the works of a lost gospel called the Gospel of Judas that captivated the attention of the media. Many tried to propose this represented a lost sect of early Christianity from the first century, but the experts that studied the text never asserted this or came to this conclusion. The overwhelming consensus was this gospel should be dated to around the same time as the Gospel of Thomas in the mid to late second century. We only have one Coptic manuscript of Judas, which is fragmented and dates to the late 3rd century. However, we believe the manuscript was originally composed about 100 years before this, possibly in Greek, because early church father St. Irenaeus mentions its existence when talking about a Gnostic group called the Cainites. And furthermore, they say, they declare that Judas the traitor was thoroughly acquainted with these things and that he alone, knowing the truth as no others did, accomplished the mystery of the betrayal. By him all things, both earthly and heavenly, were thus thrown into confusion. They produced a fictitious history of this kind, which they style the Gospel of Judas. So how do we know Judas belongs in the second century? Well, scholars argue it doesn't resemble pre-70 AD Jewish beliefs, customs, or language but more resembles Greek Gnostic ideas associated with other texts from the late 2nd century. Judas talks about aeons, archons, and has some pretty harsh ideas about the God of the Hebrew Bible. We don't see these beliefs at all in 1st century Judea, especially among Jewish rabbis, like the historical Jesus. We see these beliefs in other texts from the late 2nd century, which fit more with Neoplatonic or Gnostic ideas. If Judas belonged in the 1st century prior to 70 AD, it would be the exception and be out of place. It would not actually fit with other works which date to that time. It fits far better with later texts in the 2nd and 3rd century, and therefore it is more probable that it dates to around that time. Daryl Bach and Dan Wallace say, Studying the Gospel of Judas is like discovering a document about Napoleon discussing tactics with his officers, only to find him mentioning nuclear submarines and B-52 bombers. The Jesus of the canonical Gospels does resemble a Jewish rabbi from pre-70 AD Judea in how he speaks and the Jewish context associated with his life and ministry. Jesus in the Gospel of Judas sounds more like a Greek philosopher who uses much later terms and philosophical views we simply do not see in first century Judea. Such strange and anti-Jewish teachings would have been unfamiliar to the disciples, and it is unlikely such ideas would have even attracted any Jews as disciples. In all likelihood, if the historical Jesus said the things he did in Judas, the disciples would have accused him of blasphemy and tried to stone him. The Gnostic document is an interesting take on what the Cainites believed. Now there's an important thing we need to point out. There was no group in the 2nd or 3rd century that called themselves Gnostics. There were various groups we have dubbed as Gnostics because they believed the path to salvation was not through the atoning power of Christ, but through obtaining secret knowledge and freeing yourself from the physical plane so you could ascend to the divine realm. Judas follows along nicely with these ideas. The Gospel opens with Jesus eating with his disciples. They pray over their meal and Jesus laughs at them. A laughing or mocking Jesus is pretty common in Gnostic works. The disciples ask Jesus why he is laughing at them, and he replies that he's not laughing at them, but that their God will be praised through this. See, Gnostic groups didn't believe the God of the Hebrew Bible was the one true God, but a lesser corrupt deity that created the physical realm, and that was who the Jews worshipped. Jesus was not sent by the God of the Bible, but a different and more powerful group of gods called the Aeons. The disciples respond by saying, Master, you are the Son of our God. To which Jesus replies, How do you know me? Truly I say to you, no generation of the people that are among you will know me. Scholars believe this teaches that the Jews and the first apostles of Christianity were ignorant to the truth, which the Gnostics were actually aware of. Gnostic groups very much wanted to argue they had secret truth that Jesus taught that the early church missed. So continuing on, this of course makes the disciples angry, and Jesus notices this and responds that their God has provoked them to anger, and asks for the strongest among them to stand before him and look at his face. None of the disciples are able to do this, but Judas is able to at least stand before Jesus, 
without looking him in the eyes. And then he says, I know who you are and where you have come from. You are from the immortal realm of Barbalo, and I am not worthy to utter the name of the one who has sent you. As you can see, this is not your standard Jewish text. Barbalo is a Gnostic Aeon or goddess, so to speak, who is often depicted as the highest female entity or mother. She was considered in some texts to be the first emanation of the divine beings. She is common within the Nag Hammadi manuscripts, further cementing the fact that Judas belongs with this time frame and these other late documents. After this, Judas is told by Jesus that he will give him secret Gnostic teachings. So Judas asks a question, and this Gnostic Jesus, instead of answering him, disappears. The next day, Jesus reappears to the disciples. Now remember, many Gnostic groups deny Jesus came in the flesh, so it is common in Gnostic writings to see Jesus acting more as a spirit than a physical person that walks around. However, as we'll go over later, this manuscript seems to think Jesus had some type of body. They ask about the greater generation superior to them, probably later Gnostics writing about how they were greater than the disciples of Jesus. And then Jesus laughs and basically tells them it doesn't matter because they will never see them. The disciples then tell Jesus of a vision they had, where they saw 12 priests before an altar, who were sacrificing their own children and wives, committing homosexual acts, murdering and committing all sorts of other sins. Jesus responds with, Those you have seen receiving this offering at the altar, that is who you are. That is the God you serve, and you are those twelve men you have seen. Scholars believe this is a direct swipe at the apostles and the church that claim to be serving the real Jesus. Because Gnostics believed that the church was evil and misrepresenting Jesus' actual teachings. So as you can see, this work is quite aware of another Christian group that was started by the disciples that they detested and tried to paint as evil or misrepresenting Jesus. They are also very keen to refer to the God of these other Christians as a different and evil God because they didn't think Jesus was sent by the God of the Hebrew Bible. After this, Judas has a vision that the twelve disciples were throwing stones at him and he sees a great house with many people inside that he wishes he could enter. Jesus responds, No person of mortal birth is worthy to enter the house you have seen, for that place is reserved for the holy. Jesus then explains how the universe came into existence, as the Gnostics believed. There was this luminous cloud, and out of this cloud came the self-generated being, who created the first luminaries, aeons, and angels, without number to offer service. Then the realm of chaos was created that rebellious angels came to rule over, and within it created our world. A deity named Soklos, which means fool, created Adam and Eve after his own likeness. Scholars note this text called the God of the Hebrew Bible a fool. He was a lesser created deity, and they believe humans were created by this evil and foolish God, who thought he was the only God in existence. But some humans have a divine spark of wisdom within them, and if you do, you can leave the realm of chaos and travel to the immortal realm of the Aeons, once you find out the truth. This is why Gnostics emphasize secret knowledge and escaping the physical world, whereas Christians hope for a physical resurrection and eternity within the physical realm. Jesus then tells Judas he will be a ruler over the other disciples, and goes on to say, but you will exceed them all, for you will sacrifice the man that clothes me. Scholars believe this is referring to the human body of Jesus, and that he needs Judas to turn him over to die, so he can escape the body he has and return to the realm of the Aeons. And this is how the Gnostic text ends. Judas goes to the high priest to turn Jesus over, and there is no account of the arrest, trial, or crucifixion, because such things were not important to Gnostics, and scholars note this work shows it is later, by assuming there were earlier Gospels that already explain these events, so Judas doesn't need to explain how Jesus died because it's supposed to be providing corrective commentary on the canonical Gospels. What mattered was Jesus needed to shed his body so he could escape from physical reality, as all Gnostics believe they had to do. Jesus doesn't die for the sins of the world. He isn't a savior, he wasn't resurrected, he is just a messenger who gives the divine message on how to escape the realm of chaos, and then he leaves. This is very different to the beliefs of Jews in pre-70 AD Judea, who looked in hope for a resurrection. 
Judas simply doesn't fit with his earlier time period, and belongs in the late 2nd century with other Gnostic writings. So all in all, it is an interesting manuscript about what certain Gnostic groups believed in the 2nd century, but it doesn't really give us any good information on the historical Jesus, like the letters of Paul or the canonical Gospels give us. There is not a scholar who dates this work before 150 AD, and for good reason. As you can see from the highlights I went over, it would have been the strangest thing to a Jew living in the first century, and fits better with later developed Neoplatonic ideas and second century Gnosticism. 